Okay. Could you give us to your name, please? Well, should I look at the camera or Either to the you? camera or me. Okay. Probably me. Uh, Gary Hall. Okay. And Gary, this is the Marine Corps Tankers Association interview for capturing the history of the uh, Vet Vietnam experience for tankers. And could you tell us some stories about who you're with and when you were in country? Uh, I got into uh, country, I think, about September of 1967. Came in through Da Nang. Okay. And uh, the first part of it, we were at Jale, which is, I guess, a little north of Da Nang. It was the, I think, the company or battalion rear at that time. And uh, stayed at uh, Jale until about, I think, October of 1967. Okay and uh, got orders to uh, transfer to Camp Evans. I hadn't been assigned a tank unit at that time. It was just kind of a, okay. a holding unit, if you will, at Jolly. What was your MOS? 1811. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, we moved north to Camp Evans somewhere around October, November. I don't remember the exact dates when the, uh, the way incident uh, came to came to bloom, uh, but I I skipped that by being transferred to Camp Evans. I think the tanks from Jale were called up to the uh, the way incident at that time. Uh, stayed in uh, Camp Evans where I was uh, assigned as tank commander to uh, uh, Charlie Company Two One. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what area of the country did you? Spend your time in? Old Northern I Corps. Okay. Everything above Camp Evans. Uh, spent time uh, passing through on convoy, escort through Wei, uh, Dong Ha. Uh, spent some time at Cam Lo, Camp Carroll mostly. Okay. And uh, Operation Pegasus. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. Anything exciting about Pegasus that you can remember? Well, they're done. Uh, after Operation Pegasus, we were at the uh, outskirts of uh, Khe San, and uh, our tank company that was, was, had ended Operation Pegasus would be assigned road patrols at night, uh, where we'd take a, uh, usually a fire team of uh, grunts on the back of the tank, mm -hmm. and uh, process from camp or not camp, but LZ Hawk down to uh, a small river at the base of this uh, this hill side that we were at in order to keep the uh, road open for supply convoys. Of course, Pegasus was, uh, the reason for Pegasus right. was to open up the land route to uh, Quezon mm -hmm. uh, for, for resupply. So on the uh, day of April the 25th, Fifth of 1968, uh, I think the company gunny came aboard my tank and said you'll be taking the night patrol tonight. There was another one of the tanks that was supposed to have been assigned that evening uh, was deadlined for from some mechanical situation. So we took the patrol and, uh, like I said, we were based at LZ Hawk there and. Oh, in the afternoon of that uh, 25 April, uh, we took an incoming uh, rocket uh, barrage there on, on the uh, LZ Hawk. When that was completed, uh, I got in touch with the uh, Gulf 2-3 uh, platoon, or the uh, actually probably a squad leader mm -hmm. uh, that was going to be uh, aboard the tank with me. and. Uh, kind of let them know the instructions at what time we would, would be taking off and that type of thing, which was right after it got dark. It seemed to me like that was probably around, oh, I don't know, uh, 8.30 or 9, somewhere in that vicinity of the evening. So the uh, ground, uh, grunts mounted up and on the back of the tank, and we started down Route 9, uh, and our instructions were to go down Route 9, <coughs> excuse me, until we reached the river and then back again to make sure that the NVA didn't uh, mine the roads right. that evening. 
we had, it seemed to me like we had just started the operation. And I had, uh, my, my driver was uh, Jim Janes. He was from Chucky, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Uh, the loader was uh, John Rodriguez from California. And my gunner was uh, Charles Tucker from, uh, I think, Wichita, Kansas, I believe. Uh, and uh, before we started that operation, I remember holding my hand in front of my face, and it was so pitch black you couldn't see anything. And I'm thinking, this is crazy. I mean, I can't see the road. My driver is exposed because he's pulled the, the uh, lever on the driver's seat, which allows it to be elevated so that his body is exposed about this high above the front of the, the vehicle. So I'm standing there, I'm looking at this and uh, push the intercom button forward and say, all right, let's move out slowly, you know. And of course, the tank is not known for stealth, obviously. I couldn't understand the reasoning for the the uh, possibility of running a road patrol when everybody in the world knew you were coming and you had no idea where anything else was at. So we started out and it, it seemed like the the, the, the the patrol just started when we were ambushed and immediately to the front it uh, like being in the middle of fireworks, wow. and I'm exposed in the tank commander's cubicle at that time. So uh, a lot of chaos was going on. There was a lot of noise on the radio from the uh, the grunts that were were being hit as well. To, as as we later learned, there were several satchel charges and things thrown at the tank. So about that time, I pulled, reached around for the tank commander's cupola to pull it closed to button up for, for the battle. And before we'd started, I had the loader uh, load a round of canister, which is a anti-personnel, 90 millimeter canister round is an anti-personnel weapon that shoots small pellets, almost a cylindrical roller bearing type thing. And so we talked about that before we left. I said, if we're going to be uh, ambushed, it'll be close to the roadside. So I had the gun tube depressed on the uh, inside of the road because the outside of the road was the, uh, the mountainous area. So I assumed we would probably be ambushed from the, uh, the inside of the road. So when that uh, fire started happening, and I buttoned up. As I was buttoning up the tank, I felt a hand pulling against the uh, hatch in order to compete for what I believed to be a North Vietnamese getting ready to drop either a grenade or a satchel charge down on the inside of the turret, which would have obviously taken out the rest of the, uh, the patrol. So he's on the back of the tank. About the time you're reaching it for the Again, group. pitch black and your mind, or I mean your, your vision is completely gone because yeah. of all of the explosions that have taken place in front of you. Now the tank was dead in its tracks at that moment in time. And I intercom to Jimmy, the, the driver, I said, move through, move through, you know, uh, the, uh, the ambush. At the time we were doing that, I was firing the canister round and kind of bumping the turret around so that it would, not knowing which direction they were coming from, just kind of bumping and firing as fast as the loader could load. And uh, Charlie Tucker uh, was instructed to fire the 30 cal. So we were kind of not knowing exactly the position of the turret in relationship to the vehicle and all the chaos and everything. We were shooting the 90 millimeter canister rounds in the uh, uh, 30 caliber uh, machine gun. Uh, I radioed the command post to let them know that we had been hit and about the same time, uh, you know, I had talked to Jimmy about uh, moving forward, but he never replied anything on the intercom. So as I was uh, radio in the command post that we'd been hit, the tank began to move, and I assume maybe that Jimmy had probably been uh, dazed from the, 
the initial blast or something like that, maybe regained consciousness and was ready to move forward. So about the time that it started moving at a fairly fast pace, assuming we were moving out of the ambush, uh, the tank took a sharp bend over the side of the road, which I knew was a real mountainous area in that way. And it, uh, it started going down that hill at a very fast rate. I can even remember feeling the, the tank getting airborne from hitting a, a position where it lightened the vehicle and it came down hard. Um, seemed like an eternity. I'm sure it was, you know, probably less than a quarter of a mile down the side of that mountain, but I was thinking in, in all of that time that it was uh, out of control and running down that mountain that I had seen some fairly sizable cliffs that I had imagined that we would probably be heading in that direction. So that was uh, the next fear. Had no, didn't even have a clue as to what had happened to the eight grunts on the back of the tank. I mean, there was so much chaos going on that uh, uh, there wasn't any communication once uh, we started the tank down the side of the hill, uh, you know, it was all over. Uh, like I said, what seemed like an eternity, it finally came to a rest at the bottom of that ravine. Uh, didn't know whether or not the enemy had followed us down or whatever and was coming down to uh, finish off uh, taking a tank out or not. So I traversed the turret and it wouldn't traverse much further than, you know, just a few degrees either left or right. So we were in a fairly steep ravine and probably some trees and things like that. So we could, uh, I, I, I traversed the tank commander's cupola and fired several rounds of the 50 caliber just to keep the enemy from, from that distance. Now, all the time that we were sitting in this ravine, and we can't traverse and not really knowing the position the turret is in relation to the driver's compartment, we couldn't tell. And Jimmy never responded to any of the uh, intercom commands and so forth. So the tank's treads were continuing to rotate as if they were trying to move out of that position like the throttle had been locked down on the tank. Uh, I figured that Jimmy was probably dead and that rotation of that uh, vehicle stuck in that ravine just kept the tracks moving and causing a great deal of friction on, on the vehicle. I let the crew know that we'd stay with the tank as long as we possibly could, trying to figure out some situation as to what we can do to evacuate or where we were at or you know what we would need to do. Eventually, you could see through the vision rings of the uh, cupola that the fire was starting to build on the tracks because of the friction is causing the rubber on the tracks to actually catch fire. And we started receiving some smoke on the inside of the turret. So I had the crew uh, don their gas mask to see if we could stay with the tank as long as possible. And the tank started to have the, the flames leap up over the gypsy rack where our extra ammunition and things were stored. And it began uh, cooking off several of the small arms rounds we had back there. And so I knew that we were going to have to evacuate the vehicle uh, as soon as possible because I, I could see a little bit of flame starting to leap inside through the turret ring where it uh, came in contact with the, the hull. So I told the crew to take the 30 caliber machine gun. I would grab the grease gun, grab all the hand grenades that we had available and any ammunition belt that we could carry out of the tank <coughs> uh, in the event that we had to encounter the NVA when we got off the vehicle. I remember opening the, the loader's hatch, going through that hatch that night, uh, how it was almost a metallic tinge, if you will, as if you knew you were going to be shot on sight because 
the tank was completely engulfed in flames at this time. I mean, it was rounds were cooking off in the in the gypsy rack, and flames were coming around the side of the tank. So I was quite well silhouetted coming out of the uh, out of the tank, and I. I said, well, you know, I'll go out if I'm not hit within, you know, a very short period of time, then you follow suit and we'll find uh, some kind of protection outside of uh, outside the tank. So we got out without too much of an incident and found uh, uh, kind of a refuge in the, uh, like a shell crater or something like that, not far from the tank. The tank continued to be on fire. Uh, and the worst part was just when the the flame started getting on the inside of the uh, turret where they started cooking off the 90 millimeter rounds and the rest of the small arms rounds and things. And we were probably maybe from here to, I don't know, 50 feet away from the tank. And uh, then the, the, uh, the 90 millimeter rounds started cooking off and it was, we were fighting to stay from being hit by our own shrapnel created from the explosion of the uh, the 90 millimeter rounds going off. It seemed to me like it was in the wee hours of the morning that it started to finally had exploded all that it could possibly do. And of course, uh, the engine had since died when all uh, the fuel was consumed and, and uh, the fire had, had, had stopped the, uh, the tank from running. So the, the longest part of the night, of course, was when we lay there in the uh, foxhole, not really not knowing where we're at. We had, a, like I said, a 30 caliber machine gun and a couple of hand grenades and a grease gun and whatever rounds that we could carry with us. And we're sitting there and somewhere in the evening, I don't know what time, probably, I'm gonna guess maybe one, two o'clock in the morning, seems like, there was a flashlight that came down the hill, which I thought odd. We were always instructed never to use white light in, in a combat zone. And so I'd, I, I thought that it was probably the NVA coming to search the vehicle or coming to uh, engage uh, any troops that might be still alive or whatnot. So I, I whispered to the other guys, I said, don't fire the weapons. If it gets to a certain point, I'm gonna pull a hand grenade. I had my finger on the pin, and I'll lob that grenade towards that position. That way it won't give away where we are in case there are others to, uh, to follow. So the flashlight came down almost to the tank itself, and just at the point where I had decided that was the, the moment, the flashlight turned around and went back up the hill, so I didn't have to throw the grenade. And the rest of the night was eerily quiet because you could just seem like you could hear the NVA all around you. I'm, I'm sure they weren't, they were already gone, but I think the, the thing that entered my mind the most is not knowing where we're at and the possibility of being captured mm -hmm. was of the worst possible thought. You know, I'd heard of all the atrocities of uh, being captured by the NVA and so that would be the worst thing, and I figured we'd probably have to uh, do combat if, if we needed to, whatever it took to stay alive for as long as we could and uh, resist being captured. So the first break of light the next morning, you know, uh, still not knowing our position as to where the enemy was and so forth, I had everybody stay, you know, pinned pretty much down in the, in the uh, area where we'd started. And about you know, a little bit of daylight where you could see up on the ridge of the road. I saw a, a couple of people in a green uniform, but at, at that distance you couldn't tell whether it was NVA or if it was uh, uh, our own uh, uh, Marines coming for the rescue. So then uh, we stayed put, didn't stand up or anything like that. And then I saw a black face looking over the, the ridge there, and I knew that we had come, uh, the rescue party, had, the Marines were there, so then we stood up and, and uh, waved our, our hands, and uh, still thinking at that point in time, there may be some other NVA in the bush there that uh, may have seen the same thing, but uh, yeah, you get a little paranoid about things like that when you're sitting in a foxhole all night, but 
they came down, they, they got us, and uh, they were amazed that we were actually alive because the spot report of which I got a copy of the following day had indicated uh, MIA uh, presumed dead, and it gave the uh, last four of the serial number and, and the, uh, the rank of the individuals in the tank. And so uh, Jimmy was killed that evening in, in the initial blast of the ambush. Uh, body was never recovered, uh, except perhaps by uh, Graves reg registration. The uh, maybe the following uh, day or something like that, but it couldn't have been much to recover after having spent the night in a exploding tank with all of the rounds and the fire that had consumed it. So. That's pretty much the incident. We, like I said, we were medevac to uh, uh, Dong Ha at, at uh, I think it's Alpha Med or something like that. Uh, recovered in a few days and uh, sent back to duty. All three of you. Mm-hmm. Wow. Separately, we all went our <coughs> several ways, but. Uh, what about the grunts on the back? I'm sorry. What about the grunts on the back? Glad you brought that up. For 45 years, I had no idea. And I'd ask around once in a while, and they say, oh yeah, well, the grunts made it off. There wasn't any problem. I thought, you know, that doesn't seem right. I don't see how in the world with all that chaos, because the spot report said we were hit with RPGs, 25 satchel charges, and hand grenades, and everything else. And uh, these Marines on the back, uh, obviously the only thing they had for protection was a flak jacket. So for 45 years, I really never knew what had happened uh, uh, to the grunts that were on the back of that fire team. And I didn't get too curious because somebody that I thought would have known said that they all came off unscathed. Yeah. Then I got an email from... Uh, Gil Hernandez, who said that he was in a, the element we were operating with was Gulf 2 3, and that was uh, one of their uh, uh, fire teams that we had on the back of the, uh, the tank that night. I got an email that said that he remembers that incident, and, uh, and I kind of thought, well, it's maybe somebody there that had been at the rescue party or whatnot, and, and kind of really didn't follow up on it. And then I learned of a uh, article that was in a VFW report, I believe, and this is like maybe uh, two years ago, uh, somewhere around a couple of years ago, that this man's story, this Marine, was, was serving with Gulf 2-3 on the night of 25 April. And he was blown off the back of the tank and everything else. His body was so badly wounded that he was sent to Graves Registration because he was presumed dead. The story further goes that one of the Graves Registration uh, people there had seen his body move and then went in and told uh, somebody at the medical facility there that this Marine was still alive. They moved him back in, they checked him out, the doctor said there's no way that the man's alive, you must have seen some kind of a, you know, movement of the body just by convulsion or whatever, but, you know, it, it sent him back out. Well, this occurred a couple of more times, and finally someone paid enough attention to him, and Gil Hernandez was in fact a lot. Uh, took his... Uh, I mean, for the rest of his life, he was overcoming those scars. He never worked from the day that he was uh, ambushed and uh, it took him two and a half to three years in, in various medical facilities for him to uh, even regain any, any portion of uh, uh, his body and usage and, and everything else that's involved with it. I had the opportunity to meet Gil about two years ago at... Uh, the reunion in uh, San Diego for the first time. And uh, it's still uh, <clears throat> very emotional for me to think about how badly that man was wounded and still survived. 
He, of course, has lost all memory of any of those things that took place that day. And uh, he and I talked yesterday. He came to this reunion as well, and uh, we became very good friends. And uh, we're, we're planning on putting together what happened to Gulf 2-3 that were on the back of the tank that night. Not sure how we can do that. Of course, you know, we probably waited a long time, 45 years is a long time, but yeah. by natural attrition, you know. But we're going to try and find out. So I did find out that, uh, that he was very, very badly wounded. He knew that at least one other person was badly wounded in that. But obviously he lost consciousness after a fairly short period of time. He has no recollection of almost anything that preceded that event and certainly nothing for the next two and a half years and until he recovered. But a remarkable story and on that behalf, but it was 45 years before I ever really knew the incident there and still don't know the full detail of everything that took place. Yeah. yeah. Remarkable story. Well, it, it, it certainly was, I mean, from his standpoint. Yeah. You said he's here? Mm-hmm. Yes, he is here. You think he'd be willing to talk with us? I'm sure he would. Uh, yeah. Uh, quite a story, and he's uh, he's been a real advocate for Veterans Affairs, uh, serving as uh, probably one of the uh, national officers for a number of years in the in the VFW. But a most remarkable story. I've just never. I've, he when we sat together a couple of years ago just he and I in the same room together. He showed me his scars, and I swear I've never seen anybody that could be broken that badly and still be a survivor. Yeah. Tremendous will. Yeah. Just the will to live. Yep, it, it, it was only that and the will of God that uh, yeah. kept him going because uh, he was already presumed dead by three times at the Graves registration. And that story that I was telling you about that was in uh, like a VFW magazine or something. And the, the guy that had worked Graves Registration became obviously a really good friend of Gill's from that point forward. And he has now since deceased, but uh, he called him uh, by the name of Graves. That was his nickname because of Graves Registration. And... Uh, but he's uh, a wonderful attitude. Uh, you know, he's the uh, same as anybody else would be if they had the opportunity, they would uh, not hesitate. But yeah, Gil's story is one that, that should be included in, in this uh, event. Yeah. We'll follow up on that. Yeah. That's excellent. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay. I think we're ready. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Um, are we off? Uh, yeah. There were guys in yesterday who did a group 